Okay, let's make a start. It's my great pleasure to introduce Andrew Gossman, who will be talking about general principles of fault tolerance. So thanks, Austin, and uh, thanks to the organizers for inviting me, although um, when they asked if I had any preferences as to when to speak, I, I maybe should have asked when the banquet was. Um, but thank you all for coming anyway. Um, so uh, I was working on this talk a, a bit late last night, so it, it came out maybe a little bit backwards. So I'm going to start with the open questions. Um, and let me make it completely clear up front that I'm not going to answer any of these questions. Um, but uh, what I would like to do in this talk is kind of discuss some of the uh, kind of unifying principles of fault-tolerant constructions and of threshold results and kind of maybe give you some, some, some new ways of thinking about these things and, and unifying uh, old ways that, that might help us as answer these and other questions. So, of course, a lot of these questions we heard about yesterday or, or other points in the conference. Um, uh, adiabatic, quantum computation, um, of course, always there's talk about better threshold rates. We heard about self-correcting codes a bit, uh, and those, of course, could still be improved from what we have now. Um, some we didn't really hear about, like uh, optimizing your fault-tolerant protocols depending on the, the physical gate sets. I guess we heard a little bit about that, um, or, or maybe a little bit about experimentalist desire to, to, to get better for their gates. Um, and a little bit about specific noise models. One thing we, we really didn't have much of in this conference is magic state protocols. And I think that's an area that's uh, very fertile and could see lots and lots of improvement. Maybe not so much for the, the error rates, but for the, the types of magic states we can distill. And definitely, I don't think really any work on getting the efficiency of magic state protocols high. And probably that, that could be something that could be improved quite a lot. Um, I just threw this in. You know, we heard a lot about surface codes and, and fault tolerance in two dimensions. But one dimension is also kind of interesting architecturally. And, and right now, the, the fault tolerance protocols in one dimension are not very good. Probably that's an uh, inherent limitation. They're never going to be as good as in 2D. But, but maybe it could be improved a lot over what we have now. But uh, personally, I think the, the, the biggest and probably most important open question in fault tolerance is reducing the overhead. Um, time overhead, you can, you can tend to get pretty low if, you, if that's really your, your, uh, your goal. But space overhead, well, we all know that's, that's quite large. Um, and so one of the, th the things I want to talk about is to what extent uh, we can get that down. So now that I've done the opens, let's uh, move on to the summary, the conclusions. Um, so there's, I, I'm, I'm also doing something in this talk that I, I very rarely do, which is talk about multiple separate topics. And so normally I don't have an outline, but this time I decided it was probably a good idea to, to put one up there so that you wouldn't be totally surprised when I, I jumped from topic to topic in the middle. Um, so there's three basic topics that I want to talk about. Uh, so one of them is uh, kind of the unifying properties of fault-tolerant gates. What the different kinds of fault tolerant gate constructions we, we know so far have in common. And I think there's an underlying principle there that, that all fault tolerant gates have to satisfy. Um, then uh, a, a, a rather different topic, it'll use maybe a couple of those ideas, but mostly separate, which is suppose, as uh, John Preskill suggested yesterday, you want to come up with a new family of codes that gives a threshold. What do you need in order to do that? What are really the, the critical properties that that family, code family has to have? And then finally, um, uh, this question of overhead. So again, I'm not going to answer that question of, of what can you do with overhead, but um, maybe I'll, I'll kind, of, I kind of push and see what the ultimate limits of uh, overhead that you might conceivably reach with a fault tolerant protocol, what are they? And as you'll see, there's not much in the way of, of limits. I mean, based on what we know now. OK, so first topic, unifying properties of fault tolerant gates. So there's, uh, yeah, OK, I guess I didn't, I, didn't, I didn't quite make this consistent. So I said there's three classes. But really, there's three classes plus a grab bag of some other constructions. But the main three classes, I think we all know those. They were introduced in, in Andrew uh, Landau's uh, tutorial talk. Um, there's transversal gates, of course. 
have you know, two code blocks and you line up the qubits and do, do gates between them. There's uh, path-based gates, and topological codes are the obvious example of that, where you, you, for instance, take two defects and you move them through a path in such a way that they braid around each other, doing a, a fault-tolerant gate on the encoded subspace. And then there's ancilla-based constructions, with, with magic state uh, constructions being the, the most obvious and predominant one of those. Um, and then, as I said, there's a, a couple of other uh, kind of random uh, other constructions that, that don't fit very well into these categories. But as you'll see, there's still the same kind of basic underlying principles that, uh, that affect them. And of course, there's, you know, these, gates, these types of gates have, have different uh, advantages and disadvantages. Probably the nicest, in most respects, is transversal gates. Um, but of course, we know that you can't get a universal gates using just transversal gates. That's the result by, by Easton and Nell. Um, and uh, the other thing about transversal gates is, well, there's some codes that have lots and lots of transversal gates, like the, the seven qubit code has uh, the whole Clifford group can be done transversally. Whereas other codes have very few transversal gates. Um, it turns out that any stabilizer code has at least a few transversal gates. But, um, but there may be some non-stabilizer codes that don't have any at all. Um, and then path-based gates, they're, they're kind of nice. Um, they, uh, they're kind of slow, if you, particularly if you try to simulate them in the circuit model, because you have to, to move the, the defects around slowly. Um, and, and, and make sure that you're staying in the code space the whole time. Uh, but they don't really require many extra qubits to do. Um, whereas this ancilla constructions, well, you have to make the ancilla. I mean, that's a very hard thing to do. You need to have some big ancilla factory that's, that's churning them out and distilling them at, so that they're ready for the computation when you want to use them. Um, and so there's, you know, none of these is really a perfect solution. Uh, we would like, if we could, to get along with just transversal gates, but you know, we can to get universality. We have to we'll have to go to one of these things. And of course, exactly the set of gates that we want to use depends a lot on the code. So uh, suppose we do come up with some new code, and we'd like to to start doing fault tolerance with it. Well, there's certainly some general constructions we can use, um, and I'll discuss those a little bit later. But uh, let's try to understand first what kind of really are the options and, and what these different uh, types of, of fault-tolerant constructions have in common. So um, first, let's start with, with topological gates. So topological gates, we, we, we think of them as, as moving some defects around. But uh, we can also simulate that in a circuit model um, if, the, if the code is like a surface code or something else is implemented as a set of qubits with kind of explicit checks that we're doing to, to keep it in the code space. Um, what does is, what is this braiding look like then? Well, um, so the basic model here is we, we start with some defects. And I've just marked them red and blue so that you can, you can tell which ones are which. And we start to move the defects so that, so that they're uh, starting to, to move around each other. And eventually, you know, we'll go through a loop and we'll get back to where we started. But something non-trivial has happened in the meanwhile and the, there's been an encoded gate. So what does it mean when we think in the circuit model to say you want to move one of these defects? Well, the, the defects are realized you know, as, as holes in some lattice, right, with checks along the lattice. And moving a defect means that you, uh, you maybe destroy the, or ignore the, the parity checks in front of the defect and create new ones behind it. And that has the effect of shifting the defect over a spot. Okay? And then you do this again and again and again, and you can move the defect from one spot to another just through a, you know, single qubit operations. Of course, you want to do these in parallel so that you can, you can uh, move it relatively quickly. Um, but, but that's a perfectly valid circuit. Okay? So what we're doing is uh, we're, we're actually changing the code when we move a defect. Right? We're changing it from a code that has parity checks over here to one that has parity checks over here and not over here. Okay? 
And they're very similar, could have you know, the same number of defects in them. And the defects are about the same distance apart, because if, particularly if we haven't moved it very far. So it has kind of basically the same error correction properties as the original code. It's, it's, it's maybe, uh, depending on your notion of equivalence, it may or may not be equivalent to the original code. Um, but it's, it's really a very similar code. Okay? And then this whole process of braiding means that we move through a series of codes. And eventually, at the end, when we get the defects back into the original position, we're back to the original code. Okay? And of course, the process of doing this, we've done some logical operation on the encoded state. Okay? So, so that's how we can think of these topological codes as really another construction in the circuit model. Okay, so next. Um, so, so for topological codes, we like to think of these, these you know, code deformation as the way to do gates. And for, for other kinds of block codes, well, our preference is to do transversal gates. So why is it that transversal gates are good for you know, standard block minimum distance codes, whereas um, code deformation is, is good for topological codes? Well, um, the, the, the basic principle here is that the, the type of gate we want to use has to be matched to the type of errors that the code is designed to correct. So in particular, the uh, standard block code, you say, well, this code can, has distance d, so it can correct errors of weight about d over 2. And the advantage of transversal gates is that if there's some pre-existing errors on the code, and then we do a transversal gate, well, the, the weight of the errors don't increase, or at least the weight within a single block. Obviously, if controlled not like this can spread an error from one block to another. But um, if there was only one error in the first block, then now there's one, still only one error in the first block. There's also maybe one error in the second block. Okay? So transversal gates have the property that they don't change the weight of errors. Okay? And that's why they're good for regular gates, for regular codes that, that have a, a minimum distance. Um, now, topological gates, well, remember, they're, they're created by, by, by breaking stabilizer generators and creating new ones. So they actually can change the weight of errors. If there was a pre-existing error in the vicinity of a defect, it can grow slightly larger. And actually, the process of moving it kind of automatically creates some errors. Because you know, the new stabilizer generators, there's nothing to constrain their value to create them. Okay? Now, that's not a big problem, because you know, if, the, if the number of errors is, is not very large elsewhere in the code, you can say, well, I, I know there was going to be an error here anyway, because I just created this, this stabilizer generator. And so I should match it up with the boundary of the defect and, and get rid of it very quickly that way. But of course, if you're in a situation where you're, you're very, very near the threshold, the percolation threshold is, of this code, that extra error could kind of tip you over the edge. Okay? But the, the property, the main property of these topological gates is that the errors that you create are always local. They're, they're, they're near the defects that you're moving. Okay? And so this process of moving a defect, it can increase the number of errors, unlike the transversal gates, but it only increases them locally. And that's why if you're, if you're not you know, just right at the threshold, this is an acceptable thing to do. Because topological codes like to handle local errors. Now, I, I hope no one wants to press me on the exact definition of local errors, because of course, they're fine if you have you know, a little bit of error over here and a little bit of error over here. Um, basically, let's say it doesn't take up you know, too much of the, 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 the space of the code. Um, but, uh, but nevertheless, this, this basic property of topological gates, that, that it only creates kind of nearby spread of errors, physically nearby, is, is matched to the property of the code, that it's robust against you know, local deformations of the geometry. OK? And I mean, so I, probably this is not really new to you, but when you start to think about codes, for instance, to, to work on different error models, this principle becomes an incredibly important one. And so for instance, if um, you want to come up with a code that corrects phase error gates, 
as, as we heard about in a, in a talk a few days ago, um, you need to use diagonal gates, because diagonal gates are the ones which uh, map phase errors to phase errors. If you try to do a Hadamard gate on a code that corrected phase errors, well, it would change a phase error into a bit flip error. Okay? And then your code would not work anymore. Okay? And, and this, this effect is what makes it so hard to come up with codes that, uh, that will deal with kind of general error models as opposed to the generic error model. So, I mean, it would, you know, a lot of people say, well, okay, we should look at what types of errors are in the, in the, in the computer and design a fault-tolerant protocol that works that way. And if you can do that, that's great. But it's very hard. And the reason it's very hard is because there's very limited choice of gates that don't change the error model. OK? Um, OK. So, uh, so let's a little bit more about this difference between uh, transversal gates and topological gates. So transversal gates, as I said, they, they keep the weight of the error the same. Whereas topological gates, they actually increase the number of errors slightly. Um, and uh, this creates a, a, a kind of difference in, in how they're used, again, if you think of it in the circuit model. So transversal gate, well, in principle, you can, you can chain up a series of transversal gates all in a row, and the product is still a transversal gate. So there's no rule that says, well, you have to stop and do error correction. I mean, if you're doing uh, transversal controlled not gates, you really do want to stop and do error correction because you're spreading errors between different blocks of the code. But, you, you know, it, depending on your circuit, that, that may not really be a big issue. Uh, whereas topological codes, well, you know, as you move the defect, suppose you don't stop and do error correction. You're creating more and more errors along the path of the defect that you're, you're moving. Okay? And uh, if, you, if you didn't do any error correction at all and you moved a defect all the way around another defect, well, then you wouldn't have done a controllable gate, you'd just have created an error, right? Because you'd have, you'd have spread an error all along the path of this defect, and it would be a, a topologically non-trivial loop. So if you want to do this in a circuit model, you actually have to, to move it a little bit and stop and do error correction, and move it a little bit and stop and do error correction some more. And you have to keep on doing this all the way around the path. Okay? And, you know, for the existence of fault tolerance, that's not a problem at all. But it's one of these things, I, I was objecting to topological gates on the, the basis that they're slow. And this is one of the things that, that makes it kind of slow when you think of it in the circuit model, certainly compared to transversal gates. Um, so now as we, as we start to think of other kinds of gate constructions, you can see that, that this property of uh, increasing the number of error and then stopping and do error correction doesn't have to be constrained to topological codes. It does, of course, have to, you have to restrict your attention to codes that correct more than one error. Because you know, if one error becomes two errors, and your code only corrects one error, then you're in trouble. Um, but once you have a code that, that has a reasonable distance, or at least a reasonable tolerance to typical errors, then it's OK to, to have gates that have a property that Aharnov and Benor called spread. And so what spread is, is, well, if you start with, um, with uh, say, one error, then uh, do a, a fault-tolerant gate that has some finite spread, well, the number of errors will increase, but it'll only increase by this constant factor, which is the spread of the construction. So, for instance, you have, if you have a spread-2 gate, that one error, sorry, spread-2 uh, gadget, fault-tolerant <coughs> gate, then this one error could become two errors. Um, and then, obviously, you don't want a bunch of, of gates with, with finite spread together right away, because then if you did another such gate, the two errors would become four errors, and then it would become eight errors. And pretty soon, you'd run out of uh, error correcting capability to handle this. But if after one such gate, you stop and do error correction, well, that will reset the procedure. And of course, there might be, I mean, ideally, if the error correction were perfect, you'd get rid of all the errors. But there might be some you know, new error that occurs during the error correction procedure. So again, you might have an error. And then maybe you do another spread two gate, and now you have two errors again. You do error correction again, and so on. And so, in principle, this is a perfectly good way to, to construct fault tolerant gates. I mean, it's not as good as transversal gates. And the reason it's not is well, there's two reasons, I guess. One of them is that you need to stop and do error correction. 
But another rather important uh, property is that it means that your code is not robust against errors. Because you know, if before you had a code that corrected two errors, now you can get two errors even if there's only one thing that happened, one gate that's wrong, right? One, one error that occurred originally. Okay? And if you had two errors that occurred originally, then the spread to gate is going to kill your code. So you're not really using the error correction capability of the, the code to the greatest possible extent. And that's going to hurt your, your, your threshold value, for instance, if you have one. Um, and, uh, but you know, if, if you have a, a really good code that's, that's desirable in other ways, it's maybe still worth considering this type of gates. Particularly if, if it's only you know, one type of gate that works that way, and you need it to com complete the universal set. OK? So, um, so OK, so uh, another, now let's, uh, now let's think again about these transversal gates and start to see if we can, can find ways in which they're, they're more similar to uh, topological gates. So uh, one thing that, that we should note is that, uh, as the experimentalist will tell us, it's not enough to just press a button and have a unitary gate implemented immediately. Right? Actually, what happens is there's some laser that goes on or some voltage that's applied or something like that that causes a Hamiltonian to turn on. And that will gradually transform the, the, the initial state into the, the state with the unitary on it. Gradually, of course, you know, is, a, is a relative term. It could be over a very short time scale. But still, it moves continuously from the original state to the state with the unitary on it. Um, and uh, getting back to this condition that the, the gates have to be matched to the type of error that the code corrects, uh, this creates an additional constraint. Because it's not just the overall unitary that has to match the, the, the type of error, but actually the infinite unitary. At all times, you don't want to convert phase errors into bit flip errors if your code only corrects phase errors. Okay? And uh, that's, that's, again, important for, this, for these codes that, that correct phase errors, fault tolerance for codes that correct phase errors. Because, well, like the C0, for instance, doesn't convert phase errors to bit flip errors. Right? Uh, z tensor i goes to z tensor i, i tensor z goes to z tensor z. So you might think that you could do C naughts on phase codes. But really, there's, you can't. And the reason is because there's no way to generate the C naught without going through some gate along the way that does, I mean, unitarily generate C naught, without going through some gate along the way that does convert phase errors into bit flip errors, or entangles the two, or something like that. Okay? And that's why you actually have to restrict yourself to diagonal gates, because diagonal can be generated you know, as an exponential of a diagonal Hamiltonian, and, th and th that won't have that problem. Okay? So again, if, I mean, so if, you're, if you're trying to think of a, a code that corrects some, some other different error model, this is a very important constraint to, to take into account. Um, and of course, if, uh, so top, now going back to the similarity between topological and transversal gates. Well, topological gates, well, it's kind of obvious how we're, we're generating those infinitesimally, right? We're taking the defect and we're moving it infinitesimally. And then we keep on moving it and moving it and moving it until we get back to where we started. Um, but you know, transversal gates, we can also think of that way. So transversal gates, um, the nice thing, one of the nice, there's many nice things about transversal gates, but one of the nice things that that means that we still really do have this property that they don't increase the number of errors, is that transversal gates, they're a tensor product of things, and therefore they can be generated by a tensor product of some uh, other gates. So, um, so you know, we want to we rotate the block sphere here this direction, and so that means we can just rotate them all separately but simultaneously, and we'll eventually get to where we are, to, to where we want to go. Okay, and uh, so that's so that's a nice thing. That means transversal gates can be a tensor product of infinitesimal transversal gates. Um, but but when you start to think about it this way, you realize that uh, the, the 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 picture of what's happening with the transversal gate now looks slightly different. Normally, when we think about a transversal gate is, or when we want to try to find a transversal gate for code, we say, well, what is there we can do transversally that will take this subspace of the Hilbert space that corresponds to the code and, and map it into itself. 
But that's not really what happens when you implement a transversal gate infinitesimally. What happens is you start with this code space, you do some infinitesimal operation, and that will automatically take you out of the code space. It'll take you into a different subspace. And then you keep on going and going until you get back to the original subspace at the end of the transversal operation. OK? And this is, this is not something that people usually think about when you think about transversal gates. Usually you just say, like I said, you start and you end in the code space. But it's always done by going out of the code space and coming back. Um, and so really what's happening is you're doing a kind of code deformation. You're just doing a code deformation by local unitary operation. So uh, in, in particular, these infinitesimal transversal gates are, are local unitary operations. And what that means, they're all themselves. So they have this property that they don't increase the number of errors. And um, under any kind of transversal gate, an NKD quantum error correcting code is going to be mapped to a different, well, the same or different NKD quantum error correcting code. So this series of subspaces that we go through when doing the infinitesimal transversal gates, they're all equivalent, kind of by definition, to the original code. But in particular, they encode the same number of qubits, and they have the same error correcting capability. OK? And uh, so it's, it's an interesting thing to think about uh, taking the the, the whole s set of possible subspaces of dimension k and dividing them up under local unitary equivalence. Okay? This has been done a lot in the theory of entanglement. People have studied a lot on seeing what different classes, states you get, or occasionally subspaces you get, when you do this subdivision. And uh, so I've, I've kind of drawn. Uh, schematically some of the, the examples here when you have five qubits in a two-dimensional subspace. So for instance, one, one such component is going to be the subspace that uh, takes arbitrary thing on the first qubit, and the other qubits all have some fixed value. So for instance, one of those subspaces here is the first qubit tensor 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0 on the other four qubits. Um, but uh, as you do local unitaries, well, if you do local unitary on the first qubit, that doesn't change the subspace. It just changes the state in the subspace. If you do local unitaries on the other qubits, well, you'll change these values. But the first qubit will still be arbitrary. Okay? So this uh, component, whenever you do local unitaries on it, it's always an unentangled state. Um, then there's slightly more interesting cases like this one, generated by uh, all zeros and all ones. So this subspace contains some unentangled states, but it also contains entangled states, because it contains the, the cat state, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, plus 1, 1, 1, 1, 1. Okay? And therefore, when you do local unitaries on it, you'll get other subspaces, things generated by you know, two orthogonal, locally orthogonal product states. And they'll have the same property, that they'll have a basis that's tensor product states. And they'll also contain entangled states. Okay? Now, this code is good as a repetition code. I mean, it corrects bit flip errors. It doesn't correct phase errors, of course. It's totally, uh, it's actually more vulnerable to phase errors than, than, than an unencoded state. Um, and because we're thinking about general local unitaries, uh, that's a property that's not very well maintained local unitaries, because the bit flip errors can become phase errors and vice versa. Um, so while all of these other codes, all of these other two-dimensional subspaces in this component will have um, the capability to correct some kind of error well, there's always some other kinds of error that they, they don't correct well. And exactly what those errors are will differ from subspace to, su subspace, to subspace. But then we can move to the component that contains the five-qubit code. And the five-qubit code, um, well, so actually we know the five-qubit code is unique, but uh, there might be some permutation. So there might be you know, more than one, a couple of components that, that look like this. Um, the five qubit code really does correct errors. It corrects one general error. And therefore, all the local unitary rotations we do of that code will also correct one error. <coughs> okay? uh, 
So I should say that, that this, uh, this kind of picture is, is um, some work that I've done with uh, Lung. So um, let's examine. Like I said, there's been a lot of work in entanglement theory on classifying the different subspaces we get this way. But that's not really what I'm interested in. Really, what I'm interested in is doing transversal gates. And what that means is that we want to look at the structure of this particular component. Okay. In this particular case, there's not much point in doing that. I mean, there's, not, there's nothing new to be learned about transversal gates, because we already know the transversal gates for the five qubit code. But again, it's a picture, a kind of conceptual tool that, that maybe at some point will, will help somebody come up with new transversal gates or, or better uh, uh, design some fault-tolerant protocol. So OK, so let's look at the structure of this component that contains the five qubit code. Um, so uh, we have these components, and they consist of a bunch of subspaces. And there's some sub subspaces that are clearly closer to, to other subspaces, and some that are further, right? Because there's small local unitaries that only change each qubit a little bit, and there's big local unitaries that change things a lot. And what that means is we can put the structure of a manifold on, on this uh, component. And we can say, well, locally, we have the five qubit code, and we have codes that are very small rotations of the five qubit code. And then further off, there's some, some other types of things. Now, of course, I've drawn this as a two-dimensional manifold because you know, the screen is only two-dimensional. But really, it's a very high-dimensional thing, even for the five qubit code. Um, OK. And so let's think about what happens then when we do an actual transversal gate on this five qubit code. Well, um, like I said, we start out with the five qubit code. We do low infinitesimal uh, transversal gates, so we move to the code. And we go through a series of such codes, and eventually we get back to the original code. So that means that transversal gate corresponds to some sort of loop on this manifold. Um, and we can actually think of this manifold, put some, even some additional structure on it, think of it as a, a vector bundle. So what that means, that's um, mathematical terminology. It's not group theory, I know, but it might still be frightening. Um, so the, the, the vector bundle says, well, we're, we're going to attach a vector space to every point in this manifold. Okay? And the obvious vector space to attach in this case is the code, the error correcting code. That's a two-dimensional subspace, or more generally, a k-dimensional subspace. Okay? So at every point in this manifold, we attach to it the, the, the code corresponding to that point. And then nearby points, we can line up these vector spaces by seeing what the local unitary transform is. Right? So suppose we pick basis vectors at one point, and we say, well, OK, so let's try to apply a small local unitary transformation. So that will take us over here to a different code, and at the same time, it will rotate these basis vectors slightly. And so what that does is it lines up the vector space over here with the vector space over here. Okay? And so if we go through a path, we can, we can see how the vectors in, in, in one location get mapped to, to vectors in other locations. So that's a process called parallel transport. And the, the, kind of the, the mathematical structure that does that is called a connection. Okay? Um, so uh, for those who, who uh, know what I'm talking about, the, the, uh, you know, in terms of differential geometry, the natural thing to ask once you have a connection is, what is the curvature of this connection? Okay? But it turns out that a very small loop in this space, well, that means that you've only deformed the codes, codes very slightly. And we know from, well, for instance, from this Easton and Nil result, but I don't think you need its, its kind of full power here that the, the, the set of transversal gates for any code that has distance at least two is going to be discrete. So a small loop that can't do any, um, any kind of non-trivial operation on, on, the, on the, the, the vector space attached to the, to the base point that we started with. So if you have to start, for instance, in the five qubit code, you do a very small loop while it does some rotation, but eventually you get back to where you started, and the vectors have to line up to what they were before. Okay? And so when a small loop is trivial, that means that the connection has no curvature. This, is, this manifold is actually flat. 
Um, so again, this is kind of a, a technical uh, thing about it. I mean, if you think about a torus, most people would say torus, so that's obviously curved, right? You know, it, it has curves in it. But, but actually, mathematically, a torus does have a flat connection because you can go around in these little loops without changing the, the, the vectors and tangent vectors. They, they get back to where they started. Um, and that, that can be realized by the fact that in the, in the kind of the, the usual uh, asteroids geometry of the toric code where you can just write it flat on the plane and identify far sides. Anyway, so this is a higher dimensional manifold and it has kind of the same property. But what that means is that when we actually do a non-trivial transversal gate on the code, it means that it has to be a topological effect. It means that, that there have to be these holes in the manifold and then we, when we go around the loop and do a transversal gate, so for instance, we could do, for instance, the, the logical x gate for the five qubit code that can be done as a tensor product of x's. Well, we generate it infinitesimally, we go around this path, and that path has to be a non-contractible path. Because if it were contractible, then by this argument, it would have to be trivial on the encoded qubits. OK? So, so this is kind of a very deep connection between topological gates and transversal gates. Really, transversal gates are just topological. They're just topological by pass on this big manifold of, of equivalent locally, uni, local unitary equivalent subspaces to the code. Okay? And of course, this, this manifold is going to have a lot more structure. I mean, there's, there's going to be some loops that we can do that are non-trivial but still don't do a logical operation. So for instance, for the five qubit code, the, the stabilizer generators are things with valid transversal gates. We go out of the code, we come back to the code, and they don't do anything to the encoded state. And so those, I think, in general, are still going to be non-trivial loops, but the logical operation is, is trivial. Um, but, but then, for the, for the five qubit code, we know there's kind of three interesting uh, non-trivial loops that do do something to the encoded space. There's the logical poly, so there's x and z, and then y, logical y, we go around both of these holes. And then there's the, the logical, I call it the logical u gate. It, so this is uh, an order three Clifford group gate that takes x to y to z, and then z goes back to x. Okay, so it takes the, the axes of the block sphere and, and permutes them cyclically. Okay, so, so, so actually, since we already know a lot about the, the five qubit code and its transversal gates, that tells us a lot about the topology of this particular component of uh, the local unitary equivalent subspace. OK. Um, OK. So, uh, so now let's think about, wait, sorry, I went the wrong way. OK. So now let's think about the other kinds of constructions, magic state constructions and, and other kinds of instructions that use ancillas, constructions that use ancillas. Well, you can think about them the same way, right? So again, those magic state constructions, you, you throw in an ancilla, and then you have to do some unitary gates and maybe some measurements. Let's just Im imagine doing the measurements coherently so we don't have to worry about that. Um, and so the picture is still going to be the same. It's just the first step is we take this manifold, and we embed it in some larger manifold, really a higher dimensional manifold, by adjoining this magic state. And so this bigger manifold, well, it has you know, a similar but more complicated structure. And so then magic state construction, it consists of taking a path that goes outside the original manifold into this bigger manifold. And, but again, it has to do the same thing. It goes through a non-trivial loop. And we get back to where we started, having done a topological gate in this more general sense on the encoded state. OK? Um, and actually, that's not even fair. I guess uh, we don't necessarily have to get back to where we started, because we don't really care about keeping the magic state. Um, but in order to make, it, to make it simple and close the loop, you can say, well, what we're going to do is we're going to, to, to loop around the magic state gets destroyed, but then we create a new magic state to replace the old one. And that way we really do end up back where we started. Okay, so um, 
so this can give you at least some, some kind of idea for how to create a unified picture of fault-tolerant gates. Because all the fault-tolerant gates can be, can be seen in this most general sense as topological gates. There is, you know, well, obviously, topological gates are, work this way. You have some manifold of, actually, so it's not, it's not the obvious manifold. You're, 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 in order to, to, to put it in this picture, you have to look at the, the manifold of manifolds that are equivalent to the original one. Um, but you do some loops that, that are non-trivial. They correspond to loops that are non-trivial in this big manifold. Um, transversal gates, I, I showed you how you, they could be viewed this way. Magic state constructions can be viewed this way. And then there's a few oddball constructions, like, for instance, um, Aharnov and Medora had polynomial codes, and the Toffley gate is done, well, you do a transversal Toffley gate, but that changes the degree of the code. So you actually go to a different, different code, but it's a, a related, it's still in the family of codes, but it's a, actually a different code than the one you started in. And then you have to do some degree reduction procedure to go back to the original code. So there you can see it's, it's again, kind of in this big picture that you leave the code space, and then you move around, and you go back to the code space. It's just there's a, an explicit waypoint in the middle that's, that's interesting that they discussed. OK? And I, th I think I, it's fair to say that every fault-tolerant construction that we know of, and I, I'm pretty sure you, you could say that every fault-tolerant construction that can exist has to fit into the same general picture. That you, you take the code, you go through a series of other codes, some of which may be interesting, some of which may not be interesting, and eventually you get back to the original code, having done some non-trivial operation on the encoded space. OK? So that's, that's a kind of a fertile area to think of new kinds of gate constructions by thinking of explicit waypoints of, I will go to this code and then that and that code, and originally get back, and then eventually get back to the original code. OK. So, um, so now I'm ready to move to the next topic. Uh, I've used up a lot of my time already, uh, but this one it should be relatively quick. Um, so the, the next topic is, well, suppose we have a new family of codes. When is it going to have a threshold? What do we need to come up with a family of codes that has a threshold? Well, so obviously the first thing is we need this family of codes to, to correct lots of errors. Because the goal is to do arbitrary long computations. And during those arbitrary long computations, there's going to be, well, lots and lots of errors, more and more as the, the, the length of the computation gets bigger. So in particular, um, the codes are going to have to have uh, uh, an arbitrarily low, as we go to large examples of this family, arbitrarily low logical failure. Because particularly if we're, if we're simulating the gates one by one, then you know, each gate is going to have a logical failure rate. And that's going to be multiplied by the total number of uh, gates in the circuit we're trying to, to simulate fault tolerantly. So we need to get that logical error rate down as far as possible. And uh, to get it arbitrarily low so we can do arbitrarily long computations, we're going to need arbitrarily big codes. And um, these codes have to be good in the sense that they correct a constant fraction of errors, because that's the kind of the definition of the threshold theorem. And really, they should have an efficient decoding algorithm. Because as you get to very big codes, it's unacceptable if the, the classical processing you have to do is going to be exponential in the code size. Okay? So the decoding algorithm and the, the determining of, of what error happens from the syndrome, that should be polynomial and, and hopefully better, even like linear. OK. Um, now, uh, to, to have a threshold, it's not actually necessary that the distance d be a constant fraction of, of n. And in fact, it's not true for either concatenated codes or toric codes. Really, this is the thing, that the typical errors, they occur randomly. And so the code should correct that well. That's what's needed. And that, that, that can be true even though this distance is decreasing with n. Um, now, if you look at the toric code and the concatenated codes, you might say, well, in order to, to have this property, we have to get a lower and lower logical uh, uh, rate. Uh, k encoded qubits divided by n number of physical qubits. If you look at these two examples, you might say that, that has to go to 0. But actually, that's not true. I mean, at least we don't know it, it, it has to be true. 
It's just a matter of coming up with codes that have these other properties and yet have a, a good rate k over n. Probably, probably this is possible. Whether it's you know, viable with, with a good family of codes, I don't know. But, but I think you could, you could probably at least come up with something to, to show this is possible in principle. OK. Um, so, uh, so what else do we need for a threshold? Well, we need to have a full set of fault-tolerant gates. Um, because I'm low on time, I'm not going to go through the details. But basically, for CSS codes, that's pretty straightforward. The C0 is transversal. Measurements are transversal. Everything else you can do with magic states. With uh, stabilizer codes, you can also do uh, pretty well with magic states using nil, error correction, and ancillas. So really, the gate construction, the measurement, that's not going to be the, the stumbling block. Um, the, the catch is that to do these magic state constructions, you need ancillas, and they need to be big ancillas encoded in the same code. So that's going to come back to get us in a minute. Uh, error correction, how do we do error correction? Well, there's three known methods of fault-tolerant error correction. There's sure error correction. So that uses cat states. And the, the size of the cat state has to be as big as the parity checks in the code. Okay, so if the code has very big parity checks, very big stabilizer generators, sure error correction is out because those big cat states, they're not stable at all. Now, if you come, can come up with a family of LDPC codes where the, the stabilizer generators all have low weight, then sure error correction is, is back in the running again. And that's something very, very interesting to think about, uh, as I'll, I'll mention briefly in, in a few minutes. Um, but for other codes, uh, we can't use sure error correction. Instead, we have to use Steen error correction or nil error correction. And those work fine uh, for CSS codes and stabilizer codes, respectively. Um, but again, the constraint is that we need big ancillas. They need to be encoded using the same code. So what that means is that uh, to do a fault-tolerant protocol, it all comes down to preparing states of this code. Okay? Even just to start the computation, we need to create encoded zero states. But to do error correction, to do gates, we need other states encoded in big blocks of this code, uh, arbitrarily large as n goes to infinity. So state preparation is usually done in two steps. There's the encoding step, and then there's some sort of distillation step, where we test the states that, that we've made. And of course, you probably know about magic state distillation, um, but you can do distillation for, for other kinds of states. It's just easier. Um, again, this is something that probably can be done for pretty much any stabilizer code. So the, the, main, the main barrier, therefore, is encoding the state in such a way that the logical error rate and the physical error rate is not too high. If it's you know, moderately high, then we can use distillation to get it down. But if it's too high, then the distillation procedure won't work. Creating a really big code block, and we just do some really big encoding circuit, well, the chance of having errors along the way is incredibly high. And the, code, the encoding circuit itself might not be fault tolerant. So that could produce a logical error. And so if we just do a big, big block, then the chance of successfully doing that without having any kind of logical error is very small. And so that is the barrier which prevents us from just saying, well, here's any code. Let's use it for fault tolerance. Okay? So this is where we get to the real constraint that says we want a family of codes for, to have a threshold. What do we need? And what we need is something I call progressive encoding. So uh, for the two families of codes we know, for concatenated codes, how do we do this encoding? How do we solve this problem, being a big block with many levels of encoding? Well, we start with one level. We do a non-fault-tolerant encoding circuit to make one level. And then we do error correction to, to test it. We do another level of encoding to make a second level. And then we do error correction to test it. And then we keep on going like this. Okay. So we're stopping at various points and doing error correction before continuing on to make a bigger code block. Topological codes, we can do something very similar. We start with a small topological code. We do error correction on that, so it's not, the error, logical error rate is not too high. And then we grow it, and then we can stop and do error correction again. And we keep on growing it, and eventually we get a big block. Okay? So again, it has this progressive encoding where we we make a small code, we do error correction, we make a slightly bigger code, we do error correction, and we keep on going like that. And if your family of codes has that property, and it also has the other properties, so um, it's you know, CSS or stabilizer code, corrects a constant fraction of likely errors, the probability of logical error goes to zero as the code family gets bigger, has efficient decoding 
and it has this progressive encoding, then I think you should be able to use that family of codes to get a threshold. Whether it will be a good threshold or bad threshold depends, of course, on, on you know, a lot of other things. But, but at least it will be there. And that's something to, to, to look for and to study. OK? Um, OK, so I only have a few minutes. So on the, uh, the final topic, what is the, the minimal overhead, um, I'll just kind of say a few words. Um, so the, the basic goal that I want to have look here is C, is there a, a, a maximum or sorry, a minimum, a minimum overhead that we need to have a fault tolerant threshold? Okay? So for instance, if we can come up with a family of codes that's, that's great, that satisfies all the properties from the previous page, has a very good ratio k over n, so a very good encoded rate, is it possible that we could do um, threshold approaching that rate? And the answer, as far as I can tell, is, is quite possibly, if it's the right family of codes. So what does that family of codes have to be? Well, um, so let's think about the, the, the pieces we needed to go into this. Uh, well, Shore and Steen, sorry, Steen and Nil error correction were very good in, in, in the general case, um, but they're never going to let us approach this rate. And the reason is that they need big ancillas encoded in the, the, the same code. And so the rate is always going to get divided by two or by three. Nil needs you know, two blocks of the code, and, and Steen well, needs one at a time. Okay? And so if we use Steen or, or nil error correction, we're never going to get up to the rate of the code in terms of overhead. So that means that if we really want to get a very, very good rate, we're going to have to use Shore error correction. And as I said, you can't use Shore error unless you have an LDPC code for big codes. Um, so that's what we need. We need a family of LDPC codes that are good. Um, and uh, it turns out that that's really all that you need. Um, there's some tricks you can do to, to get rid of the, or to, to kind of reduce to, to sublinear order uh, all the other overhead that's involved. And um, yeah, so let's skip that. And so, so it turns out that if you had an LDPC code that has um, basically all the properties that I said before, plus um, its low density parity check, and Another um, technical thing is, is you need a, an error correction procedure that's robust against um, single uh, errors in the syndrome bits. Um, then you can prove a threshold that has a constant overhead. And in fact, the overhead will be the rate, or actually uh, the rate of the code, or one over the rate, I guess, because they're, they're written the other way. OK? So that's kind of a remarkable thing. I mean, that's saying that um, not only can you, in principle, do a fault tolerance with constant overhead, as opposed to the examples we have now, where the overhead grows with size, but that overhead could, in principle, be very high if the, if the rate of the code is very high. Um, and of course, the, the catch in all this is we don't even know that there exists good quantum LTBC codes, or a family of good quantum LTBC codes. But uh, this is one reason why I think it's extremely interesting if we can find some. We do know that there exist LDPC codes, right? Surface codes are LDPC, but they, they are not asymptotically good. And in particular, they don't have an asymptotically good rate. OK, so I'll, I'll finish. Um, I had these three topics. Uh, the, the first one, of course, topological gates and transversal gates, they're really the same thing. Everything is topological, all fault-tolerant gates. Um, in principle, you can, in order to, to have a family of codes that have a threshold, all you really need is, is progressive encoding that you can stop at various stages and, and slowly build up a bigger code block. Um, and if we had an LDPC code, good family of LDPC codes, then we could get uh, a threshold theorem with really good uh, overhead with very low overhead requirements. I, I, I guess I didn't, since I was going fast, I didn't say the other caveat about this. This is assuming that classical computations are not counting against the overhead. So you have measurements and you have fast classical computations that can go into this. OK, thanks.
questions? Uh, when you said that you need uh, asymptotically good uh, quantum codes, the length of the code goes larger and larger, which, need, uh, which would have efficient decoding algorithm. You mean classical decoding algorithm, is it okay to have syndrome measurement and after that simple deco classical decoding algorithm or, or you mean something else? Um, I don't know what else there could be. Uh, uh, I guess, I guess if, if there were a good, if there were bad, if there were no good classical algorithm but there were a good quantum algorithm, that, that would be an interesting question. But, but is it okay to have code that has simple classical decoding algorithm to have measurement, quantum part is measurement yeah. of syndrome and after that simple classical, is, that, is this enough? Yeah, that's fine. And, and even if your, your computer doesn't have measurement, you can always simulate the, the, the classical decoding algorithm using qubits and repetition code. Okay. Okay. So you don't, if it's a classical decoding algorithm, then um, there's classical fault tolerance is straightforward. So you might have to implement that in qubits if you don't have, have quick measurement. But you know, in principle, that can be done. You'll still have a threshold. Now, like I said, if the decoding algorithm is quantum, then it becomes more complicated because you need to make that quantum fault tolerant. And then I'm not sure what happens. OK, and another question. In one of the previous slides, you said that the code should be robust against errors in syndrome measurement, right? I missed yeah. a single syndrome error or few syndrome errors? Um, well, so, the, so that's for this last topic. Um, so the LDPC codes, because we're using sure error correction, um, there's a possibility that any individual bit of the syndrome can go wrong. And um, the problem is if we don't repeat the syndrome measurement, we'll deduce the wrong syndrome, and that could be the totally wrong error. And those could be individual syndrome bits that go wrong or multiple syndrome bits that, that don't match the actual syndrome. Um, now, probably what you can do is you can, you can match up syndromes at different times, like you do for surface codes, and figure out from there what the true syndrome is and where the syndrome bit errors are. But it would be hard to analyze that without having actual examples of codes to, to look at. Yeah, yeah, really you need several errors, yeah. I mean, a, a constant fraction of the syndrome bits can go wrong. Yeah, in the geometric picture you have of the stabilizer and the logical operator being just a mm -hmm. path around the hole. So what is the actual difference between, because both the stabilizer and the logical one seems like a non-trivial loop, right? Uh, right. So, so yeah, so, um, so the thing is that when you do these non-trivial loops, to the encoded state depends on the exact loop. So basically, there's you know, kind of a lot of different uh, kinds of loops, non-trivial loops in this code. And some of, them will, some of them will do logical operations, some of them will not. And the ones that do logical operations will obviously do different logical operations. So I don't, I, I mean, you know, if somehow you, you knew what the topology of this, this manifold were, um, I don't know of a good way to instantly say, oh, these are the interesting loops, these are the non-interesting loops. Um, I mean, you can, you can put some group theory on it and, and make some slightly stronger statement than that. But that's, that's something further to study. So, so is it possible to study some like, uh, code properties, like the uh, distance of the code, or some other properties based on this uh, like, uh, the topological picture you have? Um, yeah, so actually, that's, so that's uh, that's more in the matter of what's already been done, actually, um, of classifying the different, the different connected components. Um, so the, the theory of invariance uh, is, is one of the main things that's used to classify these different subspaces. So you look at, at properties which are invariant under local unitaries. So for instance, you can come up with some polynomial function of the, of the subspace that's invariant. And those, those polynomials are connected to properties of the codes, like the distance. Um, so if you look at the weight enumerators, for instance, that's, that's, a, that's a good example of that. Uh, so in your talk, you suggested that uh, fault tolerance schemes that use path-based ba gates should have worse thresholds than ones that use transversal-based gates because they allow errors to propagate. But of course, we yeah. know that the surface codes have a very high threshold when you use code deformation. Yeah, and if we try to use them in a concatenated fashion, the threshold drops quite a bit when we try to implement them with transversal. Yeah, so codes. I mean, it's. it's how, do you under, how do you reconcile that? Um, well, there's other considerations, basically. Well, there, okay, two things. So, um, 
So first of all, uh, there's, there's lots of properties of the code you have to take into account, right? And um, you have to take into account the, the, the actual error, inherent error tolerance of the, these codes. You have to take into account all the other gates that you're doing. You have to take into account the error correction procedure. That's a, that's a big thing. And actually, that that's really seems to be what makes the, the, the surface codes better than concatenated codes for threshold, is that the error correction procedure is much simpler. And error correction takes up a lot of the resources in any fault-tolerant protocol and creates a lot of the error budget. So concatenated codes have a bad error correction procedure um, compared to, to surface codes, and that kind of overwhelms the extra errors that creep in during gates for the surface code. And just a quick comment to close off. With uh, topological codes in general, you can trade space and time, so they don't have to take a long time. You can do them, in fact, better than instantly. Yeah, okay. And yeah, let's thank this week. Thank you.